Masechet Megillah, Daf 22. We have two main topics today. Number one is the Rosh Chodesh reading. How should we split it up uh, in order to get four aliyot here uh, with three pesukim each? Uh, this is very relevant since uh, this is the Daf for Rosh Chodesh uh, Shevat. That's perfect. And the second topic is going to be how many aliyot should be read on a fast day? Uh, Mishnah does not mention this. Uh, should it be three, like a regular chol, or should it be four, since a fast day has, is uh, more significant than just a regular day? Uh, so we begin the, back to the first topic. The Mishnah said that on Rosh Chodesh and on Chol uh, Ma'ed we read four. So specifically regarding Rosh Chodesh. Okay, so Ula asked a question to Rava. Padashat Rosh Chodesh Kesad Korinota Savit Bnei Yisrael Matal Lehemet Korbani Lachmi. So that's what we read. It's the parasha uh, uh, from Bemidbar Parashat Pinchas that talks about the sacrifices on Rosh Chodesh. Daviat Tamanya Pesukei Hechi Naavid. So actually, the whole parasha that we read is fifteen pesukim, uh, but we need to get four aliyot in here. And so the first paragraph, which is eight pesukim, what are we going to do with this paragraph? How, how, how will we split it up? Well, let's see the different considerations. Nikri tere telata, telata pesukim, peshulahu tere. Ve'en mesheirin v'parasha pachot mishilosha pesukim. So if the first two aliyot read three each, then you'll have two left over. Uh, so you'll read Aleph Bet Gimel. The next guy will read Dalit He Vav. But then you're going to have only Zayin and Chet left over. And that's a problem because uh, then, that, then if someone leaves early, they'll say, oh, look, there's two more Pizukim to that, to that paragraph, right? Then you have a Pitucha. Uh, so I guess the next Ali, uh, next Ole will read only two. That's what the person leaving early will assume. And then he will be misled uh, because the Halakha is everyone has to read at least three Pizukim. So therefore, whenever we... We either we either finish a paragraph or have to leave at least three before the end of a paragraph. So we can't read three and three. So how about let's try four and four. Nikre arba'a arba'a peshu lehu shiva. If we read four and four, then we're going to have uh, seven left over in the rest of the parasha, but uh, the rest of the reading. Beyom haShabbat haviat tere ubleshochod jechem haviat chamisha hechi naavid nikre tere meha vechad mehanach. So if we read four and four, good, that takes care of the first two uh, aliyot, that's fine. But then you have two, and this one is five. So the next, the third ole will read these two and one from the next, uh, the next uh, uh, paragraph. Well, then that's a problem because we are not allowed to uh, start a paragraph and read less than three. And this is because someone who leaves early, um, he will, no, someone who comes in, comes in late, we'll see that, oh, look, the next Ole is starting in a Pasuk Yud Bet. And look, there's only one, pa- one sentence, only one p- Pasuk in, the, in, this, in, the, in this paragraph so far. I guess the previous Ole must have read only one Pasuk. They're not going to say, they're not going to reason that he must have read more than that. They're just going to assume that he started from the beginning of the paragraph and he's going to then come to a wrong conclusion that you can read one pasuk, but that's not true. You have to read three pasukim. So that's not, that's not good. We can't do two and then one because we can't have only one uh, pasuk and the beginning of a paragraph. Uh, so that's no good. What are we going to do? Likre tere meha utlata meha peshulehu tere. So maybe the third ole, right? The first two are reading four and four each. Good. And then this guy will read two from here and three from the next paragraph. Yud alef, yud bet, yud gimel. Good. So that takes care of the third guy. He reads three into it. But then you have only two pesukim left for the last, for the fourth ole. And that's not good, number one, because he only has two pesukim. He has to read three. And also because you're not allowed to leave off, uh, stop when you're only two pisukim away from the end, because then, then someone leaving will say, oh, look, there's only two pisukim left, and assume that that Ole is only reading two pisukim. So now we have no, we have no solution. That's the question, Tadava. All right, Amar lo, zo lo shamati, kayo seba shamati. Rava's answer is, I don't know. I, have, I, don't, I never heard a tradition about this. This is actually quite surprising because Rosh Chodesh comes up every month, and uh, you'd expect that they, uh, they read the Torah, every month, so he would remember what they did the last time, 
Uh, but and nevertheless, maybe they did different things in different Batek Knesset, but they didn't have a tradition, a, learn, a teaching from his masters about the proper way to do it. And so therefore he didn't know how to answer it directly. But he said, I do have an answer because I can compare it to another analogous case. Di Tenan, a Mishnah in Masechet that we learned not long ago. Bayom Adishon Bereshit Vihirakia. Okay, regarding the Mishmarot, right? Uh, um, all year long, while the Kohanim and Leviim were doing their jobs in the Beta, Beta Mikdash, Israel oh, in, in Jerusalem and all over the world would also be appointed to take a week and they would read special prayers uh, during that time to be the messengers for, uh, to represent all, all of Bene Israel. Uh, for the communal offerings that week. What did they say? They brought out a Sefer Torah and they would read on the first, on Sunday, they would read the first two paragraphs of Bereshit. Um, and we learned regarding that, that the first paragraph of Bereshit, two people read, and Yehidakia, the second paragraph of Genesis 1, uh, one person reads. So you have three aliyot. Good. Now, Now, Oh, we happen to have this open. So here, here you go. Let's see uh, how many, how we can uh, split apart these pesukim. So the we have uh, day one is five pesukim. Day two is three pesukim. So that means the second ole will get three pesukim. It's its own paragraph. That's perfectly fine. The first five pesukim are all, all one paragraph. How are we going to split five pesukim into two uh, two aliyot? Oh, okay, good question. So, Chamisha Pesukim Havu Vetanya Akore Batora Loif Chot Mishelosha Pesukim. So, this, the first paragraph is only five Pesukim. And we know that uh, someone who makes Kesan Aliyah cannot read less than three. And we had, when we discussed this already, we had two answers. And those answers can apply to us as well. Vitimad Allah, Rav Amar Doleg, Ushmoel Amar Posek. Rav says, you should skip back. Uh, in other words, repeat one pasuk. So here's what they would do. They first ole would read Aleph, Bet, and Gimel, and then the second ole would skip back to the beginning of Gimel and read Gimel Dalid He. Very good. And then you get three aliyot each. And um, even though it is a bit of a problem because when you read Aleph, Bet, Gimel, then uh, then you're leaving off only two pesukim. And when you start Gimel, then you're only starting with two pesukim before. But in any case, that, that, is Rav's solution, that is Rav's solution. Shemuel says, you split the pasuk in half. You take pasuk Gimel, maybe for that, because of that problem. He says, better to add a soft pasuk. Says, period, and right, uh, end, of, end of pasuk, end of aliyah. And next person can get up and say, and that's enough of, for a pasuk. It's a full sentence. It has a, it has a verb, has a noun. And uh, that's what Shemuel says. So therefore, we can apply uh, the same thing here with the first ole, um, where, and this is exactly, is precisely what we do. The first aliyah recites Aleph, Bet, and Gimel. And then the second uh, ole goes back and reads Gimel again and reads Gimel Dalit um, he, um, and right, 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 reads Gimel Dalit he, and then you have the third ole can read till the Rech Nechoach Hashem, and the fourth ole can read the entire, uh, no, so the, four, the third ole reads all the way till Niska, and the fourth ole reads the last paragraph. So therefore, by repeating uh, Pasu Gimel, we can have within those uh, first six pesukim, first five pesukim, two aliyot, and we can end still with three pesukim left in the first paragraph. Okay, good. So that's his answer. Um, but now, once we do, once we brought this up uh, from Mishnah, um, um, uh, from Tanit and the discussion there, we're going to continue and talk all about that. Rav Amar Doleg, my Tamad Amar Posek. Okay, so Rav says you should repeat the pasuk. Um, of the first day of creation. Why does he not say split it in two? Oh, he says that any pasuk that Moshe Rabbeinu did not split, right? In other words, with the giving of the Torah also comes, although if you look in the Sefer Torah, you'll see there's no, there's no ta'amim. There doesn't say sof pasuk. And so theoretically, you could put a, you could put whatever you want, but doesn't, but you can't because it comes with an oral tradition. This is how you read it, and this is how you, this is where you pause, and this is where you end the sentence. And so anything that was not a, not considered a sentence in the oral reading of the Torah, you can't go and add one on your own. So that's why Rav says better to repeat and not uh, split a pasuk in two.
Shemuel Amar Paskina and Shemuel is okay with splitting it. Now, challenge to Shemuel. He was a, a reader. He was a, maybe a school teacher uh, or, or a regular reader. So he knew the Torah very well. And Sesar Gadol Hayali Esad Rabbi Chanina Hagadol. His name is Rabbi Chanina, but he used to go and uh, study with Rabbi Chanina, the great one. And he would never let me split a pasuk into, uh, into two unless I was teaching, the, uh, teaching kids. Because um, uh, they, they, it's difficult for them to learn. Sometimes you have a long pasuk and you have little kids and they can't handle reading a whole pasuk at once. So it's good to split it up into pieces. So Rabbi Chena says, I was only allowed in that case. Um, so, uh, so that, but otherwise, no. So Shemuel, how could you say, just split up a pasuk so that, you know, for convenience, so that you can have enough pasukim? So his, his, his answer would be, Hatam tama mai mishum shad shad. Over there, what's the reason why it was allowed? Because there's no other way to teach kids a long pasuk without splitting it up. And here too, the same thing. There's no other way to read five, have five pasukim for two aliyot unless you split one into two. So although in general, you should try to keep a whole pasuk together, um, but this is the be- best, this is the best solution. Good. Shmuel says split into two. How come he doesn't agree with Rav and uh, and said uh, 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 repeat the repeat the third pasuk? Oh, that's because of people coming late or leaving early. People coming late um, if they see that. Oh, look, there's only. Uh, you're starting at, at the third pasuk. I guess the first person only read two pasukim, and they'll think that's allowed. And you didn't read three pasukim, uh, and someone coming late, uh, well, uh, so someone someone leaving early will see that you read three, and there's only two left in the paragraph, and they'll assume the next person's only reading two, and they'll say, "Oh, I guess uh, I guess that's allowed," and won't realize that you're going back to repeat. So better to split it into two, and then you actually create six pasukim out of five. Good. Para Betive, a challenge to Rav and Shemuel. A parasha shel shishash pesukim, korin ota bishnaim. Braita says that if you have six pesukim in a paragraph, um, so two people can read them, right? Three and three. That's everybody would agree, no problem. Beshel chamisha pesukim beyachid. If you have five pesukim, one, only one aliyah, you can only get what, squeeze one aliyah out of five pesukim. <clears throat> So that already is a challenge to Rav and Shemuel, because Rav and Shemuel, they said, five pesukim, you can squeeze two into, the, in, in, into it, right? You can either split the middle pasuk into two, uh, actually any pasuk into two, uh, or you can repeat the middle pasuk. So why is this a problem, according to Rav and Shemuel? Furthermore, the Baraita continues and says, Karadishon Shelosha, let's say the first person got up and he read three, and now you have two left. And then what should you do? The second ole, he has to keep going. He can't just stop in that paragraph, even if that's you know the only paragraph that you need to read. You got to keep going and read one from the next. So you read two from the first paragraph and one from the next paragraph. That's Tanakama. <clears throat> you see, Tanakama doesn't worry about starting a paragraph and reading only one. But Veshomrim Shelosha. But there's a Yeshomrim here that says the second Ole will read two Pesukim from the, uh, from the first paragraph, right? The first one read three, the second guy will read two. And now when he goes to the next paragraph, he has to read three more Pesukim from the next paragraph. And that's because he would say that you cannot, once you begin a paragraph, you have to read at least three into it. Good. Vim Ita. Now, if Rav and Shemuel are correct, then the Mandamad Oleg needs Logal, Mandamad Posek needs Sok. Then what's the problem with reading with having five? We have a solution. You don't have to go and read more Pesukim from the next one. You can find three and three, even within a five Pesuk paragraph. And the answer is Shane Atam Dev Shar Behachi. Abraita is talking about a case where you can read more. For example, if you're reading a Parasha, Parashat Shavua on Monday and Thursday. And so uh, all you need is 10 Pesukim at least. But you can read more, right? If you feel like you want to read more, you can go ahead. You have a whole parasha to read. So then in that case, it's easy to add more. But if you're talking about, for example, Rosh Chodesh, where um, you, the next paragraph has nothing to do with Rosh Chodesh. So it doesn't make any sense to keep going on. Or if with the Ma'amadot, you're supposed to read the first two. It doesn't make sense to go and uh, go to the next day. 
um, or with uh, this reading of Purim, right? You only want to read the Amalek part. You don't want to go on. That's nothing to do with it. So there's no, so there's no possibility of going on. That's why Rav and Shemuel say that you have to repeat or uh, uh, divide the middle pasuk. Um, but this Baraita is talking about if, if you can keep going, then that's a better solution. Good. Okay, regarding that case, when you can keep going, so halacha is like yeshomrim that, and once you're going to start one a new paragraph, read three pesukim from that new paragraph at least. Again, by Rabbi Yosho Ben Levi, he's saying another statement that seems to be the same as the first statement. Uh, except it gives both cases. This is just like you cannot begin a new paragraph um, unless you read three, at least three pesukim from it. So too, you cannot end a paragraph unless you have at least three pesukim before the end. You can read all the way to the end, but if you don't read all the way to the end, you can't leave only one or two. You have to leave three. Okay, good. Now we ask, Peshita, isn't this obvious? Hashta uma atchalta, the, the second one. This isn't obvious from the first, we could derive it. Uma hashta uma atchalta, the kama kil tana kama, machmire yesh omerim. So, regarding leaving a, a one pasu, starting a paragraph and reading one or two pesukim, in that case, Tanakama said, it's okay, just read one pasu from the next one. And yet, yesh omerim said, no, you can't do that, read three more. So shiur de machmir tanakama lo kol sheken de machmire yesh omrim. So then, if at the end of a paragraph, not leaving only one or two before the end, which tanakama even said you can't do, all the more so the yesh omrim would say you cannot do. So once he says halacha ki yesh omrim, I can derive from a kavachomer that I cannot that that for sure I cannot um, leave a one or two pesukim at the beginning or at the end of a paragraph. So why do you need to tell me that? Because, no, you do, there could be a reason. One might say that there are a lot of people that come late. And so for the people that are coming late, if they come in and they see, oh, look, the next guy is reading from Pasuk Bet uh, of a paragraph. I guess the first guy only read one Pasuk. So that's, that's a bigger problem. Whereas people leaving early, people don't leave early and leave a Sefer Torah there. I mean, unless they have an emergency, but generally people uh, are not are going to stay uh, for the entire Torah reading. And so therefore there's less of a problem uh, for to leave one or two Pesukim at the end of a paragraph. Um, so I might've thought that that would not be a problem. So Kamash Malan, now both are problems. Okay, so that's why he said this, that halacha. Good. Now, okay, now a, a real question on Tanakh Kama, because uh, he said you can start the next paragraph and read only one pasuk. What's the difference? How come you can't leave one or two at the end of a paragraph because of people leaving, uh, uh, because people leaving early? So then you should also say people are coming late. And that's in that more often. We just said it's more often. So you should not allow someone to read one or two pesukim at the beginning of a paragraph. Uh, his answer to that is someone who comes late, he'll, he'll ask someone since he's in Bet Knesset and he'll see, wait, um, this guy, he just read from Pasuk Bet. What did the previous guy only read one Pasuk? And someone will answer him and say, oh, no, the previous guy read the, the previous paragraph also and just needed one more. I'll say, oh, OK, so he, he read three and he'll be OK with that. Whereas a person leaving, even if a person leaving is less often than people coming late, the person leaving has no one to ask. He's just walking out and now he's just thinking in his mind, hey, there was only one or two people who came left to the paragraph. Right. I guess the next guy is only going to read one or two. And so that's why Tanakama is uh, Mahmir one way, but Mekel the other way. Shalach le Rabba bered Ravad le Rav Yosef. Hilchetamai. What is the final answer? What is the halacha? Shalach le Hilcheta doleg. Vem sa'i doleg. The halacha is that you should repeat, and it's the middle uh, aliyah that repeats. And uh, this, the middle one that repeats. Okay, so this could be referring to the original Machlok Ezra ben Shemuel, which would be this. And so that would mean that, you know, the first person reads Aleph, Bet, and Gimel. And then the second Ole, which is the middle, will read, will repeat Gimel and read Gimel, Dalet, He. And then the third one reads uh, Vav, Zayin, Chet. Um, that, so it refers to that. It could also be referring to the original question, which was about Rosh Chodesh 
And so the first person reads Aleph Bet Gimel, the middle, now there's really two middles because there's four Aliyot, but one of the middles, the first middle, will read uh, Gimel, Dalet, and He, and then the third Aliyah will read from Vav down to here. He ends in a paragraph, and the last Aliyah can read a whole paragraph. And so that is the Halacha, and that's how we solve the problem. Okay, now back to the Mishnah. The Mishnah mentioned that we say we have four aliyot on Rosh Chodesh and Chol HaMoed. And then it added a rule. Zakelal kol sheyesh bo musaf and is not a Yom Tov and is not, you're allowed to do Malacha, you read four. And our question is always, whenever we see Zakelal, after we have examples and then a general rule, why do you need that general rule? So that's going to come up in the discussion here. Okay, but in the meantime, we have a question. Ibaya lehu, ta'anit sibur bechama. A uh, public fast day, how many do we read? We bring out a Sefer Torah, right? Like we do on uh, Tisha B'Av, uh, every, every fast day, right? We bring a Sefer Torah out and we read. So how many should it be? The Mishnah didn't say. Rosh Chodesh korban musaf korban musaf la. On the one hand, you could argue as follows. Rosh Chodesh and Chol Moed, there is a korban musaf. So because of the korban musaf, that is going to increase from three to four. But here, a fast day does not, have, does not have a korban musaf. So I would say, no, it's just like a regular chol day, and therefore only three. Or maybe it's not about the korban musaf, but about the extra prayer that we add. So just like when we ever, whenever we have a korban musaf, we also add uh, an amidah for musaf. On a fast day, we don't add a whole other amidah for musaf, but we do add anenu, and on some fast days, we, we, we add a whole bunch of, uh, uh, of extra berachot in the Amidah. On some fast days, we add ne'ila as well. So there are extra prayers. So maybe the point is not that it has to do with Qurban Musaf, but anytime you have extra prayers that are added, so you should also add an aliyah. And there, in that case, Tanit Sibur, we should read four aliyot. <clears throat> that, those are the two sides. We're going to bring um, a couple of proofs to try to answer it. Ta'ashema. Ve'rashei chodashim cholashomet korin arba'a. So we're going to bring a proof from our Mishnah. Since it said on Shchodesh and Cholmoed, we read four. Ha'bena ta'anit sibur shelosha. It didn't mention ta'anit, so it must be ta'anit is only three. Yeah, that's not, uh, well, you could try saying that, but emaresha. Ve'sheni b'chamishim b'shabat b'mincha korin shelosha. Ha'atanit sibur arba'a. At the beginning of the Mishnah, said on Monday and Thursday and Shabbat afternoon, we read three. So since it mentions only those, and doesn't mention Tanit Sibur, I can infer that Tanit Sibur would be four. So therefore, the Mishnah is not really helpful because it doesn't mention Tanit Sibur in either category of three or four. So there's no way to know. So let's try again. Okay, listen, pay attention to this story because we're going to be discussing it a lot. One time when Rav came to Bavel, it was a Ta'anit Sibur. Rav originally was from Eretz Yisrael, where he studied. And then he went to Bavel later and, was, uh, and, uh, uh, and started the Yeshiva of Surah there. And he was the greatest of the generation uh, in Bavel. So when he came, it was a Ta'anit Sibur. Kam kera besifra. And so he got up and he read the Sefer Torah. Pe- he got an Aliyah. Petach berich. He opened up, he started with a blessing. And you know, we said the opening blessing before. Right? He read his aliyah, he finished, and he did not say a beracha after his aliyah. Everybody said tachanun. Tachanun, they would say falling on their faces, right? They would actually go down on the ground. Uh, nowadays, um, some have a custom not to do anything at all. Ashkenazim and some Sephardim uh, will put their head, head down on their arm so to do a little bit of falling of the face, but they, they mean uh, falling prostrate on, on the ground. Everybody did, but Rav did not. Okay, we're going to have to explain all of Rav's behavior, um, but the, the most relevant is the, is the beginning part, right? What, why did he not say a baracha at the end? Okay. Now Rav, he was not a Kohen or Levi, so that means he must have gotten the Aliyah of Yisrael. So how come he... Uh, did not say a beracha after, right? If you read three aliyot, then remember we said that the first, Kohen, re, Kohen says a beracha before, the last ole will say a beracha after. So if this was the third aliyah, third and last aliyah, then how come he didn't say a beracha after? 
must be because he was expecting that there's going to be another Ole after him. There's going to be a Revi'i. And this was a fast day. And we can learn from this story that on a fast day, you had four, you should read four Aliyot. Okay, that's the attempted proof. But it's not going to last, not going to hold. La Rav Kera. That Rav Kare Bekahane. No, Rav would get the, uh, the Aliyah of Kohen. Even though he was not a Kohen, um, someone who's uh, Gadol Hador, the greatest of a generation, we give him honor. The point of giving a, uh, the first Aliyah to a Kohen is because we want to honor that person because of his status as a Kohen. But if you have someone who's the greatest of the generation, then that person should, will, will get the Aliyah Kohen. In fact, Rabbi Ovadja Yosef, in his Bet Knesset, would regularly uh, uh, get uh, the Aliyah of Kohen, even if there were other Kohanim there. Okay, so therefore, um, uh, he, he, he got Kohen. That would explain why he said a Beracha before and no Beracha after. But I don't know how many Aliyot came after, so there's no proof from here. Good. Now, question about that. Now, we know that Rav Huna, right, we brought a proof that after all, Rav, Rav Huna, who was not a Kohen, but he got the first Aliyah. So now we say, no, it's different. Rav Huna, he, it made sense for him to get the Aliyah of Kohen because his colleagues, Rav Ameh and Rav Aseh, who were Kohanim, um, and were very important people in Eretz Israel. Nevertheless, they were subordinate to Rav Huna. So the other Kohanim, as important as they were, subordinate to Rav Huna. So Rav Huna got the Aliyah of Kohen, although not a Kohen. But Rav, he was, when he was in Bavel, Shemuel was also there. Shemuel was a Kohen, and Rav would give great honor to Shemuel, even above himself. And so therefore, Shemuel should have gotten the Aliyah of Kohen, and not Rav. Okay, Shemuel, the answer is Shemuel, name mechaf hai vakayif le, le Rav, e Rav huda bad le kavod. Now, the truth is that Shemuel was subordinate to uh, Rav, and Rav uh, would, would give extra honor to Shemuel. But even though Rav would give extra honor to Shemuel, it wasn't because Shemuel was actually greater. And we would all only do that in front of him to give him honor, but when not in front of him, he would not. Because really, Rav was the greater one. And therefore, even though Shemuel was in town, even in the Bet Knesset or not in the Bet Knesset, doesn't matter. Rav would, uh, well, certainly if not in the Bet Knesset, um, Rav would take the, uh, take the Aliyah of Kohen. Uh, okay, good. So uh, now we understand that story. It makes sense that Rav would take the first Aliyah de'i. Uh, and if it was, uh, if uh, that you think that Av got Israel, the third Aliyah, then why did he say a Beracha before the Aliyah? It must be he got the first Aliyah. Now you could answer, takana. maybe this was after the Takana. Remember, in the times of the Mishnah, they said only one, only two Berachot. The first one said an opening Beracha, the last Oleg said a closing Beracha. After the Takana, they said, oh, people are coming in and out, and then they're missing out on the Beracha. And so they said it made a Takana, every Oleg should do one before and after. So even if you said he was Israel, uh, he could have said a Beracha beforehand uh, for, uh, for the benefit of the of the people um, who uh, came late, um, okay, or, or or came late. Wait a second. If so, then he should add another baracha at the end of his aliyah. Even if there's going to be a fourth, he should still have an opening and closing because he said it's after the takana. And we say no, not necessarily. No, it's different. When the Rav is present, no one's going to leave early, right? If the Rav is there, the greatest sage of the generation, right? Everyone will be embarrassed to leave early. And also they want to be there to, uh, you know, to hear, uh, hear uh, the, uh, the Aliyah from, from Rav, and, and then he's going to stay there and pray with him. And so nobody would leave early. And therefore, even if it was after the Takana, it could be that Rav would, did not, um, say a baracha after his aliyah because no one would leave, and so therefore there is no proof either way um, about where, how many aliyot there were, right? Because the truth is that Rav probably in, in, in any in any case got the aliyah of Kohen. Okay, so we have no proof 
uh, either way. Uh, so this whole uh, this whole source is um, is uh, is not helpful. But we're going to come back to discuss why Rav didn't do uh, didn't do nefilat apayim. Okay, but now a third answer, a third a source to answer our question. The question was, how many aliyot do we say do we read? On a ta'anit sibur. Tashema zea kelal. Braita says this is a rule. Kol sheyesh bo bitul melacha la'am. Kegon ta'anit sibur. Vetisha be'av korin shelosha. So there you go. Any day on which um, there is, a, a people are allowed to work. And if you keep them in, in Beth Knesset too long, then they're going to uh, have to the, be deprived of doing work. For example, so that would apply to a regular weekday. That's why we only three on a weekday because Torah Sibur, we can't keep people out of work too long. And then it says, for example, Tanit Sibur and Tisha Be'av. We read three. So there you go. We have a bright that says explicitly it's three aliyot. On a day in which uh, people will not be deprived from work because they're not working anyway. For example, Rosh Chodesh. Rosh Chodesh, nowadays we work. But there was a custom in many places that women specifically would not work, would not do work on Rosh Chodesh. And Cholamoid also, um, even though if it's Davar uh, Haved and, you know, we have certain circumstances, one is allowed to do some work. But really, Cholamoid, uh, people should be enjoying the holiday, uh, going on trips and spending time with their family and not working. So since they're not being deprived from work anyway, so Rosh Chodesh and Cholamoid, you can add Four, you can add an extra aliyah and have four aliyot. But on a regular fast day, um, it's okay to work. We did this, we did talk about Tisha B'Av, how uh, you know anyone who works on Tisha B'Av will not see blessing from it. Okay, but and nevertheless, technically, one is allowed to work. Mavashe asks, wait, but this doesn't follow um, our Mishnah, which says musaf. Okay, back to our Mishnah. If you remember, our Mishnah mentioned two examples when you have four aliyot, and that was Rosh Chodesh and Chol Moed. And then it mentioned those two examples. And then it brought a general rule, any day that has Musaf and is not Yom Tov, we read four. Why do you need a general rule? Is, isn't the general rule coming to include um, that Tanit Sibur and Tisha Be'av? And that would be four also on those days, right? Otherwise, what's the, what would be the point of the, of the general rule? So that's a good question. Now, okay, wait a second, even according to you, who would be the author of our Mishnah? It can't be anybody of the people we know who opined about this. Or to say of the following, if Tisha B'Av is on Monday or Thursday, then we, since on Monday and Thursday anyway, those are days of reading, and we want to, never want to go three days without reading Torah. So instead of reading Prashat HaShavua, we'll read something related to Tisha B'Av, um, and we also say Haftarah on Tisha B'Av. Um, if Tisha B'Av is on any other day of the week, Tuesday, Wednesday, or uh, other, other days, since it's not a regular day of reading, so you only need one aliyah, right? The point is to, to bring out a Sefer Torah and read something, but we don't need three aliyot. Remember, in any case, on Tisha B'Av, we don't invite people up to, uh, we don't give them honor to uh, invite them by call them up uh, by name to receive an aliyah. People just come uh, because it's not, a, it's not a day of celebration. So we kind of minimize, minimize that. So if we really want to minimize it, just have one aliyah. So that's Tanakama. So now, Rabbi Yosef said, no matter what day of the week it is, always read three. And never read less than three, even on Tisha B'Av. If it falls on Tuesday or Wednesday, always three aliyot, and you have a uh, haftara. Okay, good. Now, a question to Ravashe. Ravashe, you inferred from the fact that it says Zakilal that that's an extra word, that there must be that there are four aliyot on Tisha B'Av. But the Braita that actually talks about Tisha B'Av says either three or one. So you're not following anybody. Vela, so a oh, good question. Vela kashia zeakelal. Okay, but now then what are you going to do with zeakelal? What is the general rule coming to include? La la tu ya rosh chodesh moed. No, it's only coming to include rosh chodesh moed. Wait, ha behedja katani la. But rosh chodesh moed korin arba'a. You said explicitly rosh chodesh moed. So the general rule is not coming to add that. Okay, rather, 
Uh, it's just a mnemonic device. Dela tem ayom tov v'chulor shemoed ki adad aninhu ela nakot haikela biyadicha kol detafem le milta mechabre tafe le gabra yetera. So the general rule is giving you uh, a mnemonic and a reason because you might thought or you might have thought otherwise. You might have thought. Um, that Yom Tov and Cholom Oed are the same. And just like Yom Tov should be, is five, maybe Cholom Oed is still, you know, it's still uh, uh, Sukkot. So maybe I should still read five. So therefore we give you a mnemonic to remember this is the rule. Anything that is more than, it's, uh, than something else gets another Aliyah. How so? Here's, this is very important. This is the general rule for all Aliyot and you could remember everything this way. On a regular day, you read three. On Rosh Chodesh and Mo'ed, Cholom Mo'ed, you have Korban Musaf. That's one extra thing. You get one extra Aliyah. That's four. Yom Tov, Yom Tov, you also can't do Melacha. So that gets an extra Aliyah. That's five. Yom Kippurim, Da'anush, Karet, Shisha. On Yom Kippur, if one does uh, Melacha, the... Pro- <coughs> The punishment will be karet. That's more severe. So that would be that he get that. Therefore, six. Shabbat And Shabbat, if one does melacha on purpose with witnesses and they warn him before and all that, then he would get sikila, which is the highest form of capital punishment. And so therefore, Shabbat is more stringent. And that why, that's why we add an, yet another aliyah. And that is seven. So that's all the Mishnah was, was saying. But Rav Asher, sorry, we, you can't derive any uh, from the Mishnah um, something that is extra. Okay, this is really interesting because we just saw yesterday, we learned a whole bunch of things from Azeha Kilal all over Shas. Whenever it says Azeha Kilal, we learn something. But in this case, we say, no, we're not learning anything. It's just the style of the Mishnah to add an extra mnemonic, to add an extra reason. Okay, so this is good, always good to remember uh, this. Um, this example uh, where the Azeha Kilal is just a literary uh, style. Question? Yeah, but then in, on a tanit, it should be four, not three, because there is something extra in a tanit. There's nothing extra. I mean, just the fact that we're fasting? No, not... you mentioned. No, we said something else that was extra in a tanit. What did we say? Um, we do say we say anenu, right? Uh, we add, uh, we add uh, yes, true, we add extra tefillah, that's right. So in the very beginning, we asked the question, um, is it, it related to an extra korban musaf or adding any extra prayers? So uh, the final answer would be, you're right, we do add extra prayers, but it's not related to that. It has to be something more official than that. It has to be that you either, it has to be something like basically biblical, that you would either add um, extra, um, an extra korban musaf or that there's an extra prohibition regarding doing melacha. So we're only looking at these biblical things and not uh, a rabbinic uh, uh, decree to add um, some extra uh, uh, prayers. But you're right. I mean, so that, you know, Rav Hashem maybe was following the other side, but the, uh, the final answer is we read only three and the extra prayers don't count. Okay, good. Now back to the story, Gufa. Rav iklal b'aver batanit sibur, kam kera b'sifra patach bere, berich chatam vela berich. Okay, when I went to Babel, Tanit Sibur, and he read the Sefer Torah, and he read, he, he said a Baracha before his Aliyah, but not after his Aliyah. Good, we discussed all that. Neful kule aman payu, verav lana fil alan pe. Everybody said Tachanun and bow down, but he did not. Why? My tama rav nana fil alan pe. How come rav did not fall prostrate on his face? And the answer is, Ispasha lavanim haita. There was a stone floor. Betanya ve'eben naskid lo titinu bar sechem lishtachavot aleha. It's a pasuk. You're not allowed to have these figured stones on your land that you would bow down to. This is something that idolaters would do. Uh, they would put, they would draw or inscribe figures on, on marble or on stone, and they would bow down and prostrate themselves on it. So we're not allowed to do that. And this teaches that you're not allowed to do that in any other land in the Bet HaMikdash, where there was a stone floor, you are allowed to do this. And a quick story, my son went to Anta Harabait about a month ago uh, with, the, with the group of, uh, another group of Jews, and they surreptitiously prayed Mincha up there. And then on their way out, they all prostrated themselves. My son didn't even know what was going on, but they told him, they explained it to him there. And so they all did prostration on the ground, you know, like Superman style, right? With hands out and feet out. Um, and, uh, 
And so this is a this is a hal- actual halacha that now there's people doing this for the, probably the, for the first time in two thousand years um, to do prostration on harabait. Okay, kede ula da maru la lo asra torah el la rispash lavanim bilvad, and ula explain that this is a problem only on a stone floor. If it's on a dirt, if it's a, a dirt ground, then it's okay. If you will feel like a uh, you know uh, uh, or on your yoga mat. Or something, you are still allowed to do super, the Superman uh, uh, exercise. Okay, so that's why, where, where, where the place where Rav was, he had a stone floor, and therefore he did not do uh, nefilat apain. Okay, <laughs> wait a second. Then how about everybody else? If they were in a bed knesset with the stone floor, then what do you mean? How could you say everybody else did hishtachavaya and only Rav didn't? No one is allowed. And the answer is Rav havai. No, in front of Rav there was this uh, paved area of a stone floor. Maybe he was in the front of the Beit Knesset on the, you know, on the stage and over there he couldn't, but in the, in the back where the, most of the people were was just a dirt floor. And so that was allowed. Okay, fine. Then how come Rav didn't just walk to where everybody else is and then he could do Nefilat Apayim there? That would be to have to make everybody wait till he goes. And then, you know, once he was walking in front of people, they all have to stand up. And so Rav didn't want to bother anyone. So he just, he, he prayed, but he didn't, he didn't uh, fall on his face. Maybe Rav is the only one that actually stretched out his arms and legs. Everybody else might have done only the, you know, only put their head, their head down, or maybe didn't do anything, uh, or they maybe just bow down a little. So since Rav was all, the only one that actually did that, so only that's maybe, maybe the whole floor was in fact stone, but Rav was the only one that did uh, stretching out arms and legs, and that's why he didn't do nefilat apayim, and everybody else did it in, 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 the, in his usual way. Everybody else did do it in their usual way. Okay, Rav, so how come he didn't uh, fall on his face without doing stretching out arms and legs, right? Just uh, just bow down a little and not so much, or just on, on knees and not uh, not all the way down. Uh, no, he doesn't like to change his usual usual custom. Since he does it uh, with, uh, with outstretched arms and legs all year round, so he it's all or nothing, and he didn't want to change the way he usually does it. Another answer. A different answer altogether. Nothing to do with the stone floor, but rather um, the Rabbi Elazar taught that an important person may not fall on his face unless he knows he's going to be for sure answered, like Yoshua bin Nun knew he was going to be answered and, uh, and, and fell on his face and said, and said, Hashem, please help us in the war. Uh, the reason for this is because the people will see, you know, the Gadol Hador goes and falls on his face, the intense, intense prayer. And what if he's not answered and, you know, rain doesn't come? And then everybody's going to say, ah, oh, see, I guess he's not so great. And so we, want, we don't want people to have dis, uh, dis, disrespect to the, to the great sage. And therefore, they should not do Nefilat Tapaim unless they're sure they're going to be answered. And maybe that's why everybody else did Nefilat Tapaim, but he did not. Good. And uh, now we're just going to explain all the different types of bowing. When we say the word kida, um, uh, that's a type of bowing that is all, with the face on the ground. And because it says Batsheva, she does Batikod <clears throat> when um, when she came in to uh, to greet uh, the king, king King David, and it says to on on the ground. So that therefore that's all the way on the ground. Kiri al birkayim bechenomer mikeroa al birkav. Kiri means just going on one's knees, not faced on, uh, not all the way down to the ground. Ishtachavaya zopishut yadaim v'daglaim. Ishtachavaya is all the way down with arms and legs outstretched and the face all the way on the ground. Shenemad havon avo ani ve'ima ve'mechav echechad ishtachavot echa. Arsa, right, in response to Yosef's dream, Yaakov says, are we all going to come and bow down on the ground? So you see, this is also face on the ground. Okay, Levi, Achve Kida, Kamed, Rebi, Ve'itela. Now, Kida was even more difficult than the, than the rest of them. Kida is face on the ground, but it's, you have to do it in a way with only using thumbs, right? Some, it's like a, doing a push-up uh, with only thumbs, and that gives a lot of stress. You have to go all the way down, and then bring yourself all the way back up with only using thumbs. So it puts a lot of stress on stress on not only the thumbs, but also the legs. And so Levi one, one, time, one time was showing the bee how to do kida, and he became lame, he became limp 
because of that. Wait, is that the reason he became lame? There's another story uh, that says one should never uh, speak uh, uh, speak uh, um, uh, impertinently towards God. You shouldn't say insulting words because one time a great person did that and he became lame. And that was Levi. If you remember what right, we saw in Masechet Hanit, he, where his prayer was, Hashem, oh, you went up to Shamayim and you're, 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 you're doing, doing your own thing and you're ignoring the suffering of your people. So that's an ac- accusatory prayer and it's too, too, uh, too, too pushy. Uh, an, an, an inappropriate prayer. And that's why he became lame. So not because he, he did uh, he did kida. Have a got my And the answer is, it's both. If it was only one or the other, then maybe he wouldn't have. But he made this terrible, he made this uh, inappropriate prayer. And then he did this, um, this uh, difficult act. And because of the demerit of, the, of saying that, that prayer, so then in this act, he was injured. And last line, This is one time I, I, I saw Avchia um, Barabin said, I, I witnessed Abaye and Rava that they would not do Ishtan Chavaya. They would masle, they would only bend down, they would bend over uh, and, and you know, bow or on the side or something like that. And they would not fall prostrate on the ground. And so you see that there were lots of different customs. Uh, nowadays, um, I don't know anyone except, I guess, my, I guess that those people on Harabait who were doing Ishtah Chavaya. Uh, otherwise, we don't see that too much. Even on Yom Kippur, there's, the different, uh, there's different customs about how we go down. So that's really the only time of the year that we actually practice any type of uh, bowing all the way to the ground. Um, but you see in olden days, uh, different sages and different people had different ways of, uh, of bowing and falling on their face during the filata paim. Baruch Adonai Amen ve'amen.